Yeah, welcome everyone. Um, I'm very glad to be able to introduce you a speaker for tonight. That is Fudia Nancy Schroeder. And I think most of you know her already. She's the abbess of Greenwich Farm Zen Center in Clarence County. And just for those of you who do not know Wingoch Farm Zen Center, that's one of the major training places of the San Francisco Zen Center in the Soto Zen tradition. And what's special about this place is that it's not just a, like a residential Zen practice center, but it's also an organic farm. Mm -hmm. So we have also the combination here of Zen practices, organic farming, and of course communal living, mm -hmm. which is a very fascinating place and beautiful. So if you have time, please all visit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please. Um, yeah, and so I guess um, for your shoulda, I received Dharma transmission in the Shinryu Suzuki lineage from Kenshin Red Anderson in 1999. And she has been a resident of the San Francisco Zen Center since over 40 years. Mm -hmm. And she has held most of the important administrative and teaching positions in the Zen Center. And now she is the abbess, as I said before, at Rebuild Farm. She has been a very um, active supporter of programs for children, people of color, and so on, and also of the interface community. And in 2008, um, she was elected for the Women's, uh, Marin Women's Hall of Fame, which is a very honors um, recognition. And yeah, I would, we are looking very much forward to hearing your talk tonight. And please join me in welcoming Agus Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. very kind. <clears throat> So the title of my talk, I think maybe you all saw the poster with my picture on it, and it said, are you awake? <laughs> so it's not really a trick question, it's a real question, and that's uh, what I'm going to be talking about uh, this evening. So for this talk, I'm going to be using the first and second cases from the Gateless Gate Koan collection called the Mumon Khan. And I'm going to discuss how one goes about finding one's way into spiritual practice without knowing just what it is that we're looking for, or where we might look to find it. So for me, encountering Zen was the gateless gateway into a question that I didn't even know that I had. Are you awake? Implying as it does that perhaps I am not. So the Zen story itself begins at the moment that the Buddha, the awakened one, held up a flower and a monk by the name of Mahagashapa, the great ascetic, faintly smiled. So this idea of a wordless transmission was itself carried along for centuries over great distances until by the time I arrived here on planet Earth, a full-blown Zen tradition had been passed along from warm hand to warm hand, as they say, for over 2,500 years. So Soto Zen, our particular brand of Buddhism, has its own creation myths that can be traced through the names and the teachings attributed to the Zen ancestors, beginning in those ancient times in India, traveling by camel along the Silk Route to China, and by perilous ocean crossings from China to Japan. Suzuki Roshi, the Japanese Zen master who founded the San Francisco Zen Center in the early 1960s, on the other hand, arrived in America on a commercial jetliner. And therein lies the unique challenge for the Soto Zen tradition to not only survive, but to thrive here in the West in this all too postmodern age. I can remember when I first came to live at Green Gulch Farm up in Marin County, where we grow vegetables, we bake bread, and we spend long hours in seated meditation. One of our senior members came to the staff meeting in tears because she'd heard that we were going to buy a fax machine. And she was quite fearful that it was going to be the end of Buddhism. And I must say, we are still waiting to find out whether her prediction was correct or not. So I have lived in this community, as someone once called it, of mystics and introverts for over 40 years. I raised a daughter at Green Gulch. I've served in a multitude of monastic positions, from guest student to head cook to now being the abbess. And my view of our community is not unlike the view that a fly might have once caught on sticky flypaper. I really can't see the big picture at all. But I do ask the new people who come with fresh eyes every week, the ones we call guest students, if they can tell me how we're doing, how we're taking care of them, how we're taking care of the practice and of the responsibilities of a communal life, and especially how we are caring for the teachings of the Buddha. 
So it's the teachings of the Buddha that brought me in through the door of the Page Street building in San Francisco those many years ago and have kept me interested up into this very day. And yet, as we all know now, as practitioners, as scholars, as teachers of the Buddha Dharma, there is much less to be certain about now than when I bought my first copy of Zen Mind Beginner's Mind in a small bookstore in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. And when I first saw the picture of a much-loved Zen master, Shunryu Suzuki, who was and is the inspiration for the way that we at the Zen Center are endeavoring to live our lives. And so, therefore, I'm going to talk about this evening is within the limits of my own understanding and practice, of course, and yet it has been the underpinning of my entire life. And the reason for sharing with you the question that I often ask myself, and sometimes in the dark of a long sitting, I will speak it out loud into the quiet room. Are you awake? When the Buddha was asked by a traveler who noticed his unusual appearance, what are you? Are you a god? He said, no. Are you a water spirit? He said, no. Are you a demon? No. Are you a human being? No. Then what are you? The Buddha replied, I am awake. So Zen for me is basically a response to that very question and to the historical inquiry that followed as each human being endeavored to find out just what it means to be awake and how they'll know if and when they find it for themselves. As many of you may know, there are two main strands of Zen, or what we might consider approaches to awakening, that arrived in Japan from China many, many centuries ago, called in Japanese Rinzai and Soto Zen. Having spent the better part of my practice life under the banner of Soto Zen, with this emphasis on shikantaza, or what we call in English, just sitting, I felt over the years somewhat reluctant to undertake a study of koans, which I understood to be the primary approach of the Rinzai school, and in some sense, a rival tradition. And yet the founder of Japanese Soto Zen, Dogen Zenji, who had traveled to China in the 13th century, returned to Japan with Dharma transmission in the Soto Zen lineage, and yet he already had received transmission in the Rinzai tradition from his traveling companion, Myozen, himself a Dharma heir of Myo-an Isai, the founder of Rinzai Zen in Japan. And although I have been personally quite content with the practice and the teachings of Soto Zen, as I have received them in California, based as they are in the mind-blowing and gut-wrenching teachings of Dogen Zenji, such as his masterpiece, the Genjo Kon, wherein we are taught that our everyday life experience is the most fundamental koan of them all. And still, in recent years, I have enjoyed turning toward the teachings and teachers of the Rinzai School for an enrichment of my own studies, as well as for a growing admiration of an approach that many have taken and found beneficial to their own deep wish to experience awakening for themselves. So what I'm going to offer this evening are a few thoughts regarding my own encounter with the koan tradition through an informal study of the first two koans in the collection called The Gateless Gate. Koan is a word that has become quite familiar to many of us in recent years, seeming to refer to some kind of a puzzle or a riddle or an odd and clearly unanswerable question. In fact, koans are recordings of conversations between usually two people who are both interested in the secret of life. A few examples of the kinds of questions that one will find in a real koan are, what is it? Where are you from? Where are you going? What is the great meaning of Buddhism? And of course, are you awake? How a student answers such questions is what makes the exchange something to be remembered and passed along, and in some cases, for many centuries. So this word koan comes from the Chinese words kong an, meaning a public case. Originally, it referred to the magistrate or the judge, the kong, the table at which he sat, which came in Zen usage to represent both a decisive judgment as well as a very good story. So what I liked about these two stories, which are found at the very beginning of the Mumankan, is that they are clearly a complementary pairing. And before I tell you these stories from the Zen tradition, 
one's about a dog and the other about a fox. There's an all-important undercurrent to these stories that runs through the entirety of the Buddhist tradition itself, and that is the teaching of the two truths. The two truths about this one reality that we all share, the one that we are sharing right now, always right now. These truths go by various names, ultimate truth and conventional truth, or absolute truth and worldly truth, function and essence, or as in the Perfection of Wisdom Sutras, form and emptiness. So much has been written and taught about these two perspectives on the one reality. One of the most important teachings was written in the second century by Indian master Nagarjuna, known in the Mahayana tradition as the second Buddha. So this particular teaching by Nagarjuna, I'm going to read you a small section, is taken from chapter 24 of his masterwork, The Fundamental Wisdom of the Middle Way, Mula Majamaka Karika. The Buddha's teaching of the Dharma is based on two truths, a truth of worldly convention and an ultimate truth. Those who do not understand the distinction drawn between these two truths do not understand the Buddha's profound truth. Without a foundation in the conventional truth, the significance of the ultimate truth cannot be taught. Without understanding the significance of the ultimate truth, liberation is not achieved. By a misperception of emptiness, a person of little understanding is destroyed. Like a snake incorrectly seized or like a spell incorrectly cast. And for that reason, that the Dharma is deep and difficult to understand and to learn, the Buddha's mind despaired of being able to teach it. For whom emptiness is clear, everything becomes clear. For whom emptiness is not clear, nothing becomes clear. So Nagarjuna goes on to say, and yet liberation is not some ultimate reality existing beyond the phenomenal conditioned world, behind the veil, of conventional truth, for that would commit us to an eternalism, a view of something like heaven or everlasting life. Emptiness is the ultimate truth of reality and of liberation. Nirvana, too, is empty of its own existence. There is nothing that distinguishes samsara from nirvana. There is nothing that distinguishes nirvana from samsara. And the furthest limit of nirvana is also the furthest limit of samsara. Not even the subtlest difference between the two is to be found. So this is what our practice is guiding us to understand and to realize. How we do that is still up for discussion. Do we just sit, shikantaza, as we emphasize in our Soto Zen temples, or do we concentrate in our meditation on the words of the Zen ancestors such as mu, as our friends in the Rinzai tradition teach us to do. In my understanding of the distinction between these two approaches to the realization of an awakened mind, the one school, the Soto Zen, places emphasis on the oneness or the, the interfusion of essence and function, of form and emptiness, of the ultimate and conventional truth, as opposed to the emphasis of the Rinzai school on a realization of the emptiness aspect of reality through what might be called a breakthrough experience. You know, Eureka, I found it. There's a very interesting story about Suzuki Roshi when he was a little boy. His science teacher had taken his class out into a field to look for this special salamander. And Suzuki Roshi, on finding the salamander, called out, I found it, I found it. To which his teacher replied, Suzuki, we are looking for the salamander, not for you. So anyway, in Soto Zen teachings, whether we recognize it or not, breakthrough is already happening in each moment, each phenomena, as opposed to some special experience or state of mind. In fact, as we are warned, a big experience might be very difficult for people to recover from. For example, when the imaginary barrier separating an imagined self from the rest of reality drops away, we humans may construct an imaginary barrier of a no-self quite a bit more powerful than the first. This is sometimes called the Zen sickness, notoriously difficult to cure. I found it, I found it. 
I once asked a Japanese Soto Zen teacher, Katagiri Roshi, if I could take up the study of koans. And he said, well, of course you can, and you should go study in a Rinzai Zen monastery. And then he said, koans can be helpful, but they are very hard to get rid of. When Dogen went to his Chinese Zen teacher, Ru Jing, to share the breakthrough experience that he just had, he reportedly said, body, mind, dropped. To which Ru Jing responded, dropped, body, mind. In other words, now drop that as well, over and over again. Drop it, drop it, drop it, like black rain on a temple roof. And yet, with such cautions in hand, and if from nothing more than curiosity, I have peeked into the workings of our so-called rival Zen tradition to see what helpful teachings might be available for me there. Besides, koans don't in fact belong to anyone. As with all of the Buddha's teachings, they have been freely given and widely disseminated. So here's the first of the two Zen koans that have piqued my interest of late. A monk asked Jiaozhou, does a dog have Buddha nature or not? Jiaozhou said, no, Mu does not. In Rinzai Zen teacher John Tarrant's introduction to this koan, he cites Rainer Maria Rilke's advice to a young poet. I would like to beg you, dear sir, to have patience with everything unresolved in your heart and to try to love the questions themselves as if they were locked rooms or books written in a very foreign language. Don't search for the answers which could not be given to you now because you would not be able to live them. And the point is to live everything, to live the questions now. And perhaps then, someday, far in the future, you will gradually, without even noticing it, live your way into the answer. So it may be that the first step in entering into spiritual practice, in other words, into a deep inquiry about this life, is to find out what your own questions really are. You know, what is it about your life that seems unfulfilled or unsatisfactory or unrelinquished or just simply stuck? And although you may already feel the question, sometimes referred to as a great doubt, unless you discover a way to articulate it, it remains in the realm of what we can think of as unrequited love. It is unnameable, unlocatable, unrecognizable, missing piece of your own heart and mind, a vague and persistent longing. Such questions, the one that seem to ache, are referred to in Zen as barriers or as gates, as in the title of the collection of koans in which Zhao Zhou answers, Zhao Zhou's answer to the dog appears, the gateless gate or the gateless barrier. This koan of Jiaozhou and the dog has been around for a very, very long time, at least a thousand years, and is still considered the best one for beginners entering into the systematic koan practice of the Rinzai school's approach to what is called a breakthrough, a breakthrough into awakening. So this question of breakthrough, as I said, is one of the primary issues on which the two Zen schools, Soto and Rinzai, seem to part ways at least as far as emphasis is concerned. So just what is the gate that we are trying to open anyway? John Tarrant calls it the gate of the heart. I really, I really like that. The gate that opens up our hearts to the simple joy of being alive, such as in the definition of nirvana that I have grown to prefer over others, nirvana as utter contentment. Another way to understand opening the gate is to think of it as entering into a new or a different space than the one you're already used to. In the case of koans, that might mean opening to a new way of seeing things, such as the shift that can take place by focusing on the context in which the present moment is being lived, or what Suzuki Roshi called big mind. Mostly we humans seem wired and subsequently trained to focus our attention on the content or the foreground of our field of awareness on words, and images, on memories, sensations, objects, and stories. What in Suzuki Roshi's terms is called our small mind, our self-centered, and our limited mind. Once you begin to identify with the background, the context of your life, as well as with the foreground, with the stories, in particular the ones that we call problems, then all of it, the whole show, so to speak, may begin to appear in the way that it truly exists. 
For example, think of all the stories you've ever told yourself about injuries, cold weather, blisters, your broken heart, death, fear, hunger, money, or anger. Where are those stories all now? I would propose, like mine, they are mostly long forgotten. And yet what I am not suggesting by coming to see our minds and the contents of our minds as mere transient appearances within vast spaciousness is to disrespect or disregard those appearances. This very important issue is taken up in the second koan of the Mumang Khan by Zhang and the Fox, which I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. For understanding the purpose of this first koan about the dog, it's useful to see if what I'm calling a foreground background shift might be of some value to you in coming to understand your own life, especially because it's already what's happening. The seamless flow of images and notions appearing as transitory patterns within the vast reaches of your conscious awareness. This is what the Buddha saw and said about the true nature of reality, transient, no self, and discontent. And still it's hard to believe that that's all there is without passing through the gateless barrier of great doubt. Koans, as I've said, have been around a long time, and through those centuries, many sincere humans like us have made use of them to understand themselves and this world, to come and understand the problem. For Shakyamuni Buddha, the problem was the suffering of humanity due to transiency, or what we might say was the koan of birth and death. Just as it says on the Han that we strike each morning before Zazen, great is the matter of birth and death, no forever, gone, gone, awake, awake, each one, don't waste your life. For Dogen Zenji, the founder of the Soto Zen school in Japan, the driving question, the one that sent him across the sea to China was this one. As I study both the exoteric and esoteric schools of Buddhism, they maintain that human beings are endowed with Buddha nature at birth. If this is the case, why did the Buddhas of all ages, undoubtedly in possession of enlightenment, find it necessary to seek enlightenment and to engage in spiritual practice? So what might be your driving question or problem? Finding your own question is the most essential part of the spiritual journey, the first place that you take a step onto the path. By making use of these ancient conversations between sincere seekers and those who had gone ahead of them, the ones we call the ancestors, we can begin to locate not only our own questions, but also the ones, as I said, we didn't even know or suspect that we had, such as whether or not a dog has Buddha nature. What this koan is basically about is the monk's own doubt about whether or not he himself, herself, or themselves has enlightened nature, the very question Dogen was carrying on his voyage to China. Technically, the correct answer to this question, according to the Buddha Sutras, is yes, that all beings have Buddha nature. This the monk already knew, as did his teacher. So how come Zhao Zhou says no? So that's the real koan, the one that none of us can easily escape. Excuse me, but that's not the right answer. It's certainly not the way I understand things or what I've learned, and who are you anyway? This is pretty familiar when someone we hope will simply give us a nice pat on the head instead puts up a barrier higher than the one we already know how to jump, both an unattainable barrier and an unavoidable one, if you even care. And if you don't care, that's a koan too. What the teacher is doing is basically blocking the monk from using his usual tricks, intellectualizing, emotionalizing, or willfulness to meet the obstacles in his life, all of, all of which reek of selfishness, either as conceit or as self-effacement. Instead, the monk finds himself with no escape, no easy way out, or so it seems, just no. In such a situation, the human body-mind tends to freeze. The Zen understanding of this process of freezing and then melting away is called realization. Dropped body and mind, body-mind dropped in Dogen's exchange with his teacher. Or as Rinzai said when he melted, there is nothing to it. Or the second Chinese Zen ancestor who had been sent off to search for his mind. 
I have looked everywhere and I can't find it. The mind cannot be had. Or, as our own Soto Zen founder Tozan Ryokai said on looking at his own face in the water, just this person. Amazing, right there all along. The moment when no self realizes itself. So one way to work with koans, as I understand, or any problem for that matter, is to see how our judgments arise about the problem and then to turn those very judgments over again and again, this way and that. Is this a real problem or did I make it up by myself? And little by little, one may come to understand, as John Tarrant and others have testified, how intimate and tender life truly is. After years of struggle, my heart was at rest and the world seemed like a much kinder place. Could this openness be the way things truly are? Could this be the way to freedom? Zen in itself can be seen as a radical disentanglement from thoughts and conceptualizations. And no, therefore, symbolizes both a cornerstone of Zen logic as well as a fundamental Zen exercise. The logical principle is that no human conception can grasp reality as it truly is. The exercise is to allow oneself the possibility of entering, passing the veil of illusions, into a realization of the truth of that logic. No. There's nothing that is holding us hostage except the mind's attachments to its own thoughts, its own opinions, and its own projections. Zen is nothing more than the realization of the mind's innate freedom. Woman's verse on this koan, a dog's Buddha nature, presents the true directive in full. As soon as you get into yes and no, you lose your body and you forfeit your life. In this koan, the dog represents the unenlightened state and Buddha nature represents the possibility of realizing enlightenment. The unenlightened state is traditionally likened to a dream, enlightenment to awakening from the dream. Any concepts we have about consciousness are themselves a product of consciousness and not the experience of consciousness itself. Once again, no is not the answer to whether or not the poor dog has Buddha nature. Rather, it's a technique to stop us from asking such dualistic questions in the first place, questions like yes or no. No can therefore also be used as a concentration device for clearing the mind and achieving what Buddhist meditators call stopping or cessation. Once the mind is stopped, it is possible for self-view, worldview, and one's own personal ideas about reality to be suspended for a time. The purpose of this device is not to make the mind blank, as in cutting off your head, but rather to make the mind flexible and open to reality as in fresh and fully present. No, properly utilized means the releasing of the heartfelt mind. Muman goes on to say, do not understand it as nothingness. Do not understand it as absence of something. And what Wuman is pointing to here is what the Buddha had realized at the moment of his own awakening. He realized the non-dual nature of reality, that whatever is placed on one side of a balancing scale depends on the other side, and therefore does not exist independently. Is depends on isn't. Right on wrong, light on dark, me on you, yes on no, and so on. It's all relative. This teaching of non-duality, of interdependence of all phenomena, of the non-separation of myself from the rest of the universe, and so on, is based on the experience the Buddha had when he gazed at the morning star and saw that it, the object of his awareness, as with all things, was not outside of himself, was not separate, was non-dual. In other words, all things exist by virtue of their interdependence, another word for true belonging. Interdependence or non-duality is the first of the two major frameworks that we need in order to understand what is going on with the Zen school and these koans in their effort to wake us up. The other major framework appearing in the Buddha's first sermon is the teaching of cause and effect, which he presents under the heading of the Four Noble Truths. Truth number one, there is suffering. Suffering is an effect, it's a result. There's a cause for suffering. 
Ignorance and desire are the cause of your suffering. Noble truth number three, there's a cessation of suffering. Cessation of suffering is an effect, it's a result. And there's a cause for the cessation of suffering. The cause for the cessation of suffering is the path. The path is enlightenment and enlightenment is the path. This second framework, the basis for the Buddha's teaching of causality, allowed him to answer such very human questions as, how did I get here? Why do I suffer? What difference does it make how I behave while I'm here? But most importantly to our liberation, how is it I have come to see the world as separate from myself in the first place, as dualistic? If one is successful in stopping or sufficiently slowing the mind, all such views, opinions, and questions about reality are temporarily suspended. At such a time, it's possible to see how our incessant story-making, our monkey mind chatter, as it's called, has been blocking our view of reality, as when clouds are blocking our view of the moon. The clouds represent the veil of our subjective ideas and imaginings, also known as projections, which are thereby blinding us to objective, causal, and karmic relationships, such as how hatred leads to hatred and kindness leads to kindness. To clear away the clouds for a time with an unblinking gaze at the moon shining on the mountains is the true purpose of our meditation practice. There's a wondrous poem called Snow by Dogen Zenji about just such a moment of mental clarity. All my life, false and real, right and wrong, tangled, playing with the moon, ridiculing the wind, listening to birds, many years wasted seeing the mountains covered with snow. This winter, I suddenly realize snow makes the mountains. So once the mind is stopped, even temporarily, we may be able to see how stories, the snow covering the mountain, or our small mind, as Suzuki Roshi called it, and our big mind, the big mountain of the universe itself, are truly interfused as one whole being, as one whole Buddha nature. Context and content are together, and how it has never been otherwise. Does Zhaozhou's dog have Buddha nature or not? Answer, no does not have. Although this koan about the dog is considered to be key to an experience of nirvana, to that side of reality that is characterized as having no characteristics, including sides for that matter, or what might be called the ultimate truth, there is a caution flag down on the field, the danger being in splitting nirvana and samsara into two. Much has been said about this practice of no by a great many teachers and scholars and practitioners, both pro and con. In the true Zen spirit, I hope you will choose to see for yourselves and to think for yourselves as you continue to explore your own precious lives through the filter of Buddhist teaching and practice. And that said, once a student has given no some serious attention, it's strongly recommended by both schools of Zen to follow up the no koan with the second koan in the Mumang Khan called Baijong and the Fox. The Baijong and the Fox koan is intentionally aimed at the negative tendencies into which the practitioner may fall through incorrect or imbalanced practice of the no meditation as it is promoted in the first koan. And for this reason, these two koans serve as a balancing pair for correcting the tendency of our human minds toward dualistic thinking, such as yes or no, this or that, nothing or something, samsara or nirvana, or what the Buddha referred to in his first sermon as the two extremes. And what did the Buddha call the way that avoids the two extremes? He called it the middle way, the middle way, non-duality. This teaching of reconciling the two extremes appears often in the Mahayana literature, as in chapter 9 of the Vimalakirti Sutra, the Dharma door of non-duality. And one particular example that you may also be familiar with is from Dogen's Fukan Zazengi, the general advice on principles of seated meditation. Think of not thinking. How do you think of not thinking? Non-thinking. This is the essential art of Zazen. So the balancing being, think of not thinking. How do you think of not thinking? Non-thinking. The essential art of Zazen. 
indicating as it does a call for us humans who tend to make our way in the world by constructing pairs of opposites to embrace the possibility of full awareness in which thinking, not thinking, and non-thinking are all necessary conditions for an awakened life. Therein the notion of awakening as the all-inclusive and non-dual mind of a Buddha. And as I said earlier, the second framework from the Buddha's first sermon is this teaching of cause and effect, also known as this and that causality. If this, then that. If not this, then not that a basic teaching that was found among the oldest inscriptions on ancient Buddhist temples throughout India. Ironically, the most significant and tempting examples of falling into one of the two extremes in the Buddhist tradition occurs in this very teaching of causality, and that is samsara and nirvana. A dualistic eye sees these two states as being separate and certainly not equal. A dualistic eye sees the Eightfold Pathway leading to the cessation of suffering as a pathway from here to over there, to somewhere else, thereby splitting the universe into two, samsara over there and nirvana over here. However, in the true Dharma eye, as taught by the Buddha and articulated by Nagarjuna, as I read earlier, there is nothing that distinguishes samsara from nirvana. Not even the subtlest difference can be found between the two. How much more tied up in verbal knots and gateless barriers could we possibly get than this? In the view of many, that is exactly where these teachings are endeavoring to place us, stuck inside our usual ways of getting out, and that is stuck in thinking, threatening, retreating, brooding, hiding, fantasizing, or simply forgetting all about it. Trapped inside the cage of our own karmic conditioning, inherited by us through countless generations and by our own personal habitation of that conditioning. Once we've tasted liberation or characterlessness, it's very tempting to identify with that, with the absence of self, which unfortunately often comes along with an absence of concern over how the absent self is behaving towards others. One of the dangers that took place historically in the Buddhist tradition was the moral slippage that occurred in the blinding light of a half-cooked realization of nirvana, the land of eternal silent light. Mistaking nirvana for a place where one can live outside of the dualistic regulations that accompany dualistic notions of right and wrong led to many regrettable consequences throughout the history of Buddhism right up until the present day. And yet nirvana, Noble truth number three, the cessation of suffering, is described throughout Buddhist history as the goal of the path, as the resolution of karma, and so on. Which is why a correct understanding of nirvana takes on such monumental significance for all of us endeavoring to practice in the Buddhist tradition, critical to whether we are growing ourselves into a life of true freedom or devolving further into bondage, from the iron chains of samsara to the golden chains of nirvana. So here's a very early example of what the Buddha said about nirvana, giving us a good taste of what we are up against in trying to understand the goal as being on one or the other side of any place or anything. Where there is neither earth, water, fire, nor air, neither the highest stages of trance, the jhanas, neither this world or another, nor both together, neither the sun or the moon. Here, I say, O monks, there is no coming or going, no staying, no passing away, nor arising. It is not something fixed, nor does it move on. It is not based on anything. This, I say, O monks, is indeed the end of suffering. With the rise of the Mahayana, or great vehicle teachings, the nirvana of the Buddha was re-envisioned to be an unlocated nirvana, neither in samsara nor in nirvana, leading to that other declaration by Nagarjuna in which he said that liberation isn't some ultimate reality that exists beyond this phenomenal conditioned world, behind some veil of conventional truth. Emptiness is the ultimate truth of reality and of liberation. Nirvana, too, is empty of its own existence. So on the edge of this way of talking and teaching, we turn to the second case in the Mumang Khan, Bai Zhang and the Fox. I return to an emphasis on the second of the two truths, the relative or the conventional truth, as a corrective for a mistaken view of the ultimate nature of reality. 
Baijong and the Wild Fox. Whenever Master Baijong held a meeting, an old man used to listen to the teaching along with the assembly. When the people of the assembly left, the old man would also leave. Then one day, the old man stayed behind, and the master asked him who he was. The old man said, I am not a human being. In the past, in the time of a prehistoric Buddha, I used to live on Baijong Mountain as the abbot. As it happened, a student asked me whether or not greatly cultivated people are also subject to cause and effect. I said that they are not subject to cause and effect. Mu. And I fell into the state of a wild fox for 500 lifetimes. Now I ask you to turn a word in my behalf so that I may be freed from being a wild fox. Then the old man asked the master, Are greatly cultivated people still subject to cause and effect? The master said, They are not blind to causality. The old man was greatly enlightened at, at, at these words and freed from the body of the fox. According to the Zen tradition itself, one of the most common negative outcomes in practicing with the no or the mu koan is to mistake blind ignorance for transcendence. In other words, the essential point of the wild fox story is to make it clear that the practice and experience of passing through the gateless barrier of Zen does not negate causality, reason, or morality. That the real meaning of breakthrough is breaking through the veil of subjective ideas and imaginings that blind us to the actual working of causal relationships. Zen doesn't exempt us from what is happening, but rather frees us to see what is actually happening. Zen insight frees us from compliance with the mental habits that are arising from our primordial conditioning by the three poisons of greed, hate, and delusion. It frees us to be deeply curious about the world and how it is being perceived by this singular viewing station that we call the self. The mistakes of faulty practice show rather clearly in the careless and harmful deportment of the practitioner. Zen master Ta Hui says that the outcome of mistaken no practice of denying cause and effect results in a practitioner who is crude and careless. Our job as students of the Buddha way is to find the path and then step by step to walk along it on our own two feet whether as dogs or as wild foxes, as humans, ghosts, or fighting demons, our job is to live a life of elegance with whatever we have been given. The function of Zen, the meaning of human life, is found in the perfection of our character. It shows in how we behave, in the actions of our bodies, our speech, and our thought. Once old Baijiang was free from the mesmerizing human tendencies toward wishing to be free on the one hand and fearing he wasn't on the other, his mind was open, flexible, and curious. Where did I make my mistake? The old abbot asks of the new abbot of Baijan Temple. Artful and skillful participation in the world is possible when we freely transgress, when we can admit to our errors, whether as a fox or as a Zen master. Either way, honest, albeit imperfect expedients are perhaps the most appropriate responses for imperfect situations such as whatever one we find ourselves inhabiting right now. Yikes, I'm a fox, or yikes, I'm a Zen master. So what about it? Without preferences, without picking or choosing, without complaint, such as I wish I was taller, smarter, faster, prettier, wealthier, and so on. Even in these imperfect bodies, we can live a life of ease, of compassion, wisdom, and grace, a life of utter contentment. Decadent Zen, on the other hand, comes from the malpractice of no or mu realization, from falling into emptiness, into no, and thereby getting bit by the poisonous snake of mishandling ourselves as if free. For both the old and new abbots of Bajan Temple, subjugation and release depended on cause and effect, that is, freedom obeys causal principles. So this koan is not simply a theoretical or philosophical discussion, it's a deeply personal interrogation. How is your life? How are your values? How's your behavior? Are they in alignment? What do other people have to say about you? Zen attention on causality is deliberate and focused, it's concrete and practical. As the Zen saying goes, one continuous mistake. It's only when the old Baijiang was finally able to ask himself, the new Baijiang, following an interval of 500 lifetimes, where did I make my mistake? 
that he was released from his karmic indebtedness. And to this end, I'm going to end with a brief return to Dogen's own practice question, the one that drove him to China in search of an answer to his profound internal conflict concerning the teaching of Buddha nature. Why practice if all beings already have Buddha nature? Dogen's answer was just practice, not to reach nirvana or some great understanding, but to be here right now without any goal-oriented agenda. In the immediacy of the present moment, nirvana is already here, so too samsara, with not the slightest difference to be found. That is the practice of the Buddha way, wholehearted engagement in whatever you are doing right now. And yet, as Dogen says in the first few lines of the Genjo Kon, in our attachment, blossoms fall. In our aversion, weeds spread. We humans persist in our preferences for and, or and against the objects of the world as we encounter them, not remembering to see the myriad dharmas, the flowers and the weeds as they truly are, empty of own being and dependently co-arisen, just like us. Or as my therapist used to say to me, human first, last and always. And so we go on wishing and dreaming and planning for things to be otherwise, to be different and perhaps even better than they are. And so we must go, hand in hand, through birth and death. Just like in that last scene from Toy Story 2, when all the toys are sliding down into the fire of the recycling machinery, they all look around at each other, their eyes soften, they take each other's hands and warmly smile. Just this is it. Thank you very much.